Part 3 of the Dungeon Master's Guide to the Curse of Strahd. This video follows on from Part 2, where we explored the village of Valakai and its mandatory celebrations. In this portion of the guide, we'll be looking at the following locations of Barovia. The village of Krezek, Toslenka Pass, Van Richten's Tower, and the Wizard of Wines. Chapter 8 The Village of Krezek The fortified village of Krezek lies near the edge of Strahd's domain, and the wall of mist that marks the border is clearly visible above the tree line. Yet, even here there is no escaping the vampire. In fact, the villagers are so terrified of Strahd and his wolves that they never venture away from the village. Within their walls they grow trees that provide ample wood to keep them warm on cold nights, and they draw water from a blessed pool. They have chickens, hares, and small pigs, as well as gardens of beets and turnips. The only thing they depend on from the outside world is wine. The burgomaster, Dmitri Keskrov, comes from a noble family and regularly has wine delivered from the nearby winery, the Wizard of Wines to keep the locals' bellies warm and their spirits up. Looming high above Krezek is the Abbey of St. Markovia, once a covent and a hospital, now a madhouse overrun with wickedness. After St. Markovia and her followers failed to overthrow Strahd, the Abbey became a fortress closed off from the rest of the world. Strahd ruthlessly preyed on the fears of the clerics and nuns holed up inside, but ultimately it was their isolation and greed that doomed them. The clergy began fighting over food and wine. By the time their supplies ran out, they had either been killed by each other's hands or driven hopelessly insane by Strahd's acts of terror against them. For years afterwards, the villagers of Krezek avoided the place, fearing that the abbey was cursed, haunted, or both. Then, over a century ago, a pilgrim from a distant land came to Krezek and insisted that he be allowed to reopen the abbey. The nameless man was strikingly handsome and extremely persuasive, and the villagers couldn't help but do as he commanded. Eternally young, he presides over the abbey to this day, and the locals refer to him simply as the abbot. Many villagers suspect that the abbot is Strahd in disguise, for they've heard stories of Strahd appearing in other guises. The truth, however, is even more disturbing. The Areas of Krezek S1 Road Junction The road branches north and climbs a rocky escarpment, ending at a gatehouse built into a 20 high foot wall of stone reinforced with buttresses every 50 feet or so. The wall encloses a settlement on a side of a snow-dusted mountain spur. Beyond the wall you see the tops of snow-covered pines and thin white wisps of smoke. The somber toil of a bell comes from a stone abbey that clings to the mountainside high above the settlement. The steady chime is inviting, a welcome change from the deathly silence and oppressive fog to which you have grown accustomed. It's hard to tell at this distance but there seems to be a switchback road clinging to the cliffs that lead up the walled settlement to the abbey. The old Salovich road continues west from this location, for a little more than a mile before it plunges into the foggy curtain that surrounds Barovia. Characters who follow the road north arrive at the gatehouse, Area S2. Area S2, the gatehouse. The map of Krezek includes a diagram of the gatehouse, the air grows colder as you approach the walled settlement. Two square towers with peaked roofs flank a stone archway into which is set a pair of 12 foot tall iron bound wooden doors. Carved into the arch above the door is the name, Krezek. The walls that extend from the gatehouse are 20 feet high. Atop the parapet, you see four figures wearing fur hats and clutching spears. They watch you nervously. Cut into the upper floor of each tower is an arrow slit six inches wide, four feet tall, and one foot deep. 
An open doorway leads from the archer's post in each tower to the adjacent parapet. Behind the wall, wooden ladders lead from the parapet to the ground 20 feet below. Two archers, lawful good, male and female human scouts, are stationed inside the gatehouse, one in each tower. Four guards, lawful good, male and female humans, man the adjacent walls. If the characters are seen flying or climbing the walls, the guards assume that the village is under attack and cry out in alarm. Five rounds after the alarm sounds, every able-bodied adult in the village arrives at the gatehouse, ready for battle. Kresek's Militar consists of four more guards plus 40 commoners, lawful good male and female humans, which are armed with hand axes. The double doors are made of thick wood planks bound with iron bands and sealed shut with a heavy wooden bar held in iron brackets. The bar can be lifted with a successful DC-15 strength check. The doors require a siege engine to break them open. There aren't enough people in Kresek to adequately defend the outer wall. Every 300 foot stretch of wall is watched over by a lone guard, a lawful good male or female human. The guards are trained to crouch behind the wall and sound the alarm at any sign of danger. The Burgomaster, Dmitry Kreskov. If the characters ask to be let inside, or otherwise draw the attention of the guards on the wall, one of the guards fetches the Burgomaster, Dmitry Kreskov, a lawful good male human noble. His ancestors built Kresek at the foot of the abbey after Strahd's armies conquered the valley. Dimitri is a lord and expects to be treated like one. He places the safety of his village above the welfare of strangers. He has seen adventurers before and assumes that the characters are Stride's allies or enemies. Either way, their presence spells trouble for Kresek. Dimitri isn't prepared to shelter Stride's enemy any more than he's willing to humor Stride's allies. The only way the characters can earn his favor is to help Kresek in some way, whereupon Dmitri is required by his oath of the office and his honor as a Barovian noble to show them hospitality. If the characters ask what they can do, Dmitri asks them to secure a wagon load of wine from the Wizard of Wine's winery to the south. His people have been without wine for days, and the next delivery is long overdue. If the characters force their way into town using magic or strength of arms, Dimitri tells his guards to stand down, hoping to avoid bloodshed, and does everything he can to expedite the character's departure. A character who succeeds on a DC-12 Wisdom Insight check can discern that Dimitri is trying to hide the fact that he is distraught. He is grieving over the natural death of his youngest son, Ilya, the last of his children, as described in Area S3. S3, the village of Kresek. When the characters get past the outer wall, read, The mist-shrouded village beyond the wall is nothing more than a scattering of humble wooden cottages, along dirt roads that stretch between narrow snow-dusted pine trees. So many trees, in fact, as to constitute a forest, to the northeast, grey cliffs rise sharply, and the road winding up to the abbey is easy to see from this vantage. The village operates as a commune, with no exports or money-making businesses. Villagers grow trees and vegetables, cut wood to heat their homes, raise chickens and pigs, and share their food. A few villagers have cows and mules, but there are no horses in Kresek. The village has no inns or taverns. Characters who are willing to chop wood, milk cows, or perform other chores can spend the night in the Burgomaster's cottage or some other residence. Cottages Kresek's residences are single-story pine cottages with stone chimneys and thatched roofs. Pigs and chickens are kept in door pens and coops so that they don't freeze. The Burgomaster's cottage the building closest to the outer gate is the Burgomaster's Cottage, the largest building in town, but still a modest dwelling. 
Dmitry Kreskov and his fearless wife Anna, a lawful good female human noble, have no living children. The last of their four children, Ilya, died of an illness seven days ago at the age of 14. Given their age, the Kreskovs are unlikely to have more children, a source of great consternation to everyone in the village, since that means the end of the Kreskov bloodline. The burgomaster's cottage has a wine cellar, which is currently empty, and lots of space for pig pens and chicken coops. Behind the cottage is a graveyard, where deceased members of the Kreskov family are interred. Dmitri and Anna's four children, all whom died of illness, are buried here. Several of the family caskets are empty, their contents stolen in the night by the abbot's mongrel folk and grave diggers in Area S6. Illa's plot is fresh and undisturbed, since he was only interred four days ago. The Commoner's Cottages A typical cottage is only 200 square feet, yet contains 1d4 adults, lawful good male and female human commoners, and 1d4 children, lawful and good female human non-combatants, plus the family's pigs, hares, and chickens. Every cottage has its own graveyard, where family members are interred. All the caskets planted in the last decade are now empty, thanks to the abbot's sneaky mongrel folk grave diggers from Area S6. Krezek's Law In addition to the information known to all Barovians, as explained in Chapter 2, the villagers of Krezek, known as Krezites, know the following bits of local law. Residents never leave the village for fear of being attacked by wolves, dire wolves, and werewolves. About once a month, a wagon load of wine arrives from the Wizard of Wines, as explained in Chapter 12, the winery and vineyard to the south. The business is owned and operated by the Martikov family. Burgomaster Kreskov recently lost his 14-year-old son, Ilya, to illness. Ilya was the last of four of Kresov's children. A pool to the north end of the village provides fresh water throughout the year. Next to the pool, the village's ancestors built a shrine to the Morning Lord in a gazebo. It's known as the Shrine of the White Sun. The Abbey of St. Markovia is named after a priest of the Morning Lord who took a stand against the Devil Strad after a fierce uprising. Markovia and her most loyal followers stormed Castle Ravenloft, only to be destroyed. The abbey was once a hospital and a covent, but it fell on hard times after the land was swallowed up by the mists. Some of the clergy fell prey to Strad, while others went mad and either starved themselves to death or turned to cannibalism. The head of the abbey is simply called the abbot. Arrived over a century ago, he hasn't aged a day since. He occasionally visits the shrine of the White Sun, but doesn't talk too much. He demands tribute in the form of wine, and no one knows his true name or where he came from. Many believe he is Strahd's servant, or the vampire himself in disguise. No one from the village visits the abbey anymore. The abbey's bells ring at odd times, day and night, and the place is filled with baleful screams and horrible inhuman laughter that can be heard throughout the village. Area S4, the Pool and Shrine Even under grey skies, this pool at the north end of the village shimmers and sparkles. Near its shore sits an old gazebo on the verge of collapse, a wooden statue of a mournful bare-chested man its paint chipped and faded, stands in the gazebo, with arms outstretched, as if waiting to be embraced. The pool is fed by an underground spring and was blessed long ago by St. Markovia. Its waters defy corruption, and anyone who drinks from it for the first time gains the benefit of a lesser restoration spell. The water had once even greater magic, but it has weakened over the years. The water otherwise tastes sweet and fresh. The gazebo is so frail that it wouldn't take more than a strong wind to knock it over. It remains standing because it is protected from the elements by the surrounding trees, walls and cliffs. 
The statue is a depiction of the Morning Lord, positioned so that he is reaching towards the east, the dawn. Locals refer to the statue and the gazebo as the Shrine of the White Sun, even though they have no idea why their ancestors named it so. If you had a Fortunes of Ravenloft, the Three of Glyphs, the Healer, your card reveals that there is a treasure here. The item is hidden under the gazebo. The gazebo must be torn down to reach it, and doing that doesn't sit well with the locals. If the characters damage the gazebo and don't repair it, any charisma checks they make to shift the attitude of the villagers have disadvantage. Area S5, The Winding Road The switchback road that hugs the cliff is 10 feet wide and covered with loose gravel and chunks of broken rock. The ascent is slow and somewhat treacherous. The air grows colder as one nears the top. The road climbs 400 feet, doubling back on itself twice before reaching Area S6. The Areas of the Abbey The following areas correspond to the labels of the maps of the Abbey of St. Markovia. The mongrel folk that infest the Abbey are all descendants of one family, the Bellevues, and all suffer from some sort of madness. Whenever the characters interact with a mongrel folk who isn't detailed here, you can roll on the indefinite madness table in the Dungeon Master's Guide, or choose from one of the available options on the table to determine how that particular mongrel folk's madness is expressed. Most of the mongrel folk in the Abbey are locked up because they can't be trusted to wander about unsupervised. The only mongrel folk who are free to move about are the Abbot's grave diggers, Otto and Siegfried, and his faithful two-headed manservant, Cloven. Cloven Bellevue rings the Abbey's bell in Area S17 when the Abbot decides it's time for dinner. The toll of the bell causes all the mongrel folk in the abbey to hoot and holler with excitement as they wait to be fed. The windows of the north wing are made of leaded glass that is translucent. Good for letting in the light, but not good for seeing through. The windows of the east wing are broken outward and have damaged shutters. Area S6, the north gate. The road from the village climbs above the mist to the wide ledge on which the abbey is perched. A light dusting of snow covers the trees and rocky earth. The gravel road passes between two small stone outbuildings, to either side of which stretches a five foot high, three foot thick wall of jumbled stones held together with mortar. Blocking the road are iron gates attached to the outbuildings by rusty hinges. They appear to be unlocked. Viewed through the gate, the stone abbey stands quiet. The two wings are joined by a 15 foot high curtain wall. A belfry protrudes on the rooftop of the closer north wing, which also sports a chimney billowing grey smoke. The iron gates are unlocked, but squeal loudly when someone opens them. Two gate guards are on duty, but they aren't awake when the characters arrive. Characters who succeed in a DC 12 dexterity stealth check can climb over the low outer wall without waking them. If one or more characters fail the check, or if the characters open the gate, the guards rouse themselves and stumble forth to confront the trespassers. The guard gates are Otto and Siegfried Bellevue, two lawful evil mongrel folk, which you can find in the appendix. They sleep under piles of musty animal furs. Both are loyal servants of the abbot, yet not so good at guarding. If the characters seem friendly, the mongrel folk escort them to the courtyard in Area S12 and ask the characters to wait there while they fetch the abbot in Area S13. If the characters seem hostile, the mongrel folk let them enter but don't accompany them willingly. Hanging on the inside wall of each guard post is a net woven from twigs and pine needles, as well as a shovel. Otto and Siegfried cover themselves in the nets when they skulk through the village at night in search of fresh graves to dig up. Role-playing the mongrel folk. Use the information here to role-play the mongrel folk guards Otto and Siegfried. Otto Bellevue is 4 feet and 9 inches tall, 
and squats instead of standing upright. He looks like a beardless dwarf with patches of donkey flesh covering his face and body. He has one human ear and one wolf ear, and a protruding wolf snout and fangs. His arms and hands are human, but his legs and feet are leonine, and he has a donkey's tail. He can barely speak common, and his laugh sounds like a donkey's bray. He wears a plain wool cloak. Otto has the standing leap feature. His madness is embodied in the following statement. I am the most smartest, wisest, strongest, fastest, and most beautiful person I know. Siegfried Bellevue. Siegfried stands 4 feet 7 inches tall. The left side of her face and body is covered with lizard scales, and the right with tufts of grey wolf fur. Between these tufts are pale human skin. One of her eyes is that of a feline, and her fingers and hands resemble cat paws with opposable thumbs. She has a gruff voice and wears a grey cloak with a black fur trim. Siegfried has the dark vision feature. Her madness is embodied with the following statement. I don't like the way people judge me all the time. Area S7, the graveyard. Stunted pine trees grow out of rocky earth in the graveyard near the foundation of the abbey's north wing. The windows of the structure are cracked panes of leaded glass. Ancient gravestones burst forth from a thin crust of snow in the yard. Beyond the low wall that surrounds the graveyard, the ground falls away. The village lies 400 feet below. The view is breathtaking. Carved into each gravestone is the name of a long dead priest or nun. Some of the names include Brother Muratek, Brother Valen, Sister Constine, and Sister Lenora. The Sun's Grave The gravestone marked X is carved with roses and bears a three inch diameter sun shaped indentation on each side. Engraved beneath the indentation is the name Petrovna. If Tasha Petrovna's holy symbol, found in Castle Ravenloft, in Chapter 4, Area K84 in Crypt 11, is placed in the indentation, both the holy symbol and the indentation vanish. Then read, A ray of golden sunlight breaks through the clouds to the west and shines upon the grave. The fog and gloom shrink back from its brilliance, as the sunlight causes the gravestone to crack and crumble revealing a ring within. The sun ray lasts for one minute. If the characters smash the gravestone without placing Tasha Petrovna's holy symbol in first, they find nothing within its remains. The ring is a ring of regeneration. Area S8, the Garden Gatehouse. A gatehouse stands at the entry to the Abbey Gardens. The gatehouse is empty. Area S9, the Gardens. Nestled between rising and plunging cliffs are four rectangular garden plots enclosed by five foot high walls of mortared stone. White rabbits nibble on turnips uprooted by the cold. Two lifeless scarecrows stuffed with gullets and sackcloth hang from the wooden crosses pounded into the cold hard earth. If the characters haven't cleared out the east wing, add The abbey's east wing looms over the garden its shattered windows dark and disturbing. A door leads into the forlorn edifice, which apparently isn't abandoned as one might have hoped. From within comes the laughter and wailing of things that should not be. The rabbits and scarecrows are harmless. The garden contains a meager assortment of root vegetables and squash. The door leading to area S15 isn't locked. The fortunes of Ravenloft if your card was the Two of Glyphs, the missionary, a treasure is revealed to you here. The item is hidden in the straw-filled gullet of the southernmost scarecrow. If the treasure is removed from the scarecrow, seven whites erupt from the gardens and attack. They wear the tattered library of Strahd's house. Area S10, the Abbey Entrance. A 15-foot high curtained wall joins the abbey's two wings. Beneath its battlements, two guards stand at attention, their features obscured by fog. Below them, set into the wall, 
is a pair of 10 foot tall wooden doors reinforced with bands of steel. To the right of these doors mounted on the wall is a tarnished copper plaque. The plaque bears the abbey's name under which appear these words. May her light cure all illness. The guards on the wall are propped up scarecrows that wear corroded chain shirts and clutch raised spears in area S18. The characters who succeed on a DC 10 wisdom perception check discern the charade. The double doors are heavy but unlocked and they can be pushed open to reveal a foggy courtyard in area S12. Area S11, the inner gatehouses. These two empty buildings help support the curtain wall in area S18 that encloses the courtyard, area S12. The wooden doors that lead to them are unlocked. Area S12, the courtyard. The thick fog that fills the courtyard swirls as if eager to escape. The courtyard is surrounded by a 15 foot high curtain wall on which stand several guards with their backs to you, or so it seems at first. It's clear now that these guards are merely scarecrows. The wooden door to the north and the east lead to the abbey's two wings. In the centre of the courtyard is a stone well fitted with an iron winch to which a rope and bucket are attached. Along the perimeter, tucked under the overhanging wall, are several stone sheds with padlock wooden doors as well as three shallow alcoves that contain wooden troughs. Two wooden posts pounded into the rocky earth have iron rings bolted to them and chained to one of them is a short humanoid with bat wings and spider mandibles. The quiet is shattered by horrible screams coming from the sheds. If the characters are escorted here by Otto and Siegfried Bellevue from Area S6, they are asked to wait in the courtyard while the Mongol folk fetch the abbot from Area S13. Area S12A, the well. The well is 80 feet deep. Hiding 20 feet down is a chaotic evil mongrel folk named Mishka Bellevue. He clings to the wall of the shaft and scuttles up to attack anyone who shines a light down on him. Mishka Bellevue stands 5 feet tall and has a wry spindly build. He has three red spider eyes on the right side of his face while the left side appears human. He has a frog's foot in place of a left hand, and a taloned crow's foot where his right foot should be. He has the spider climb feature, and in his madness, he's discovered that he enjoys killing people. Area S12B, the old trowels. These three horse trowels are badly rotted and fall apart if handled or jostled. Area S12C, the chicken sheds. Each of these sheds is fitted with an iron padlock. Cloven Bellevue from area S17 carries the keys to these locks. If the characters open a shed, read. This shed holds the shattered remains of several chicken coops. Shackled to the back wall is a wretched humanoid with bestial deformities. There are nine of these sheds each one containing a howling or mewling mongrel folk from Appendix D. Area S12D, the tethering posts. Iron rings bolted to these wooden posts were once used to secure horses. Chained to one post is a chaotic neutral mongrel folk named Marzina Bellevue, the older sister of Mishka Bellevue from Area S12A. If the characters approach Mazina, read. The creature chained to the post flaps its leathery wings and takes to the air, but it doesn't get far before its chains go taut. She flutters about madly, screaming nonsense. Mazina Bellevue is skittish and afraid of everyone and everything, except for Cloven Bellevue from Area S17, whom she allows to come close enough to feed her. Marzina stands 4 feet 5 inches tall and has a hunched posture. Long stringy black hair hides much of her face, but clearly visible are the spider mandibles and teeth that replace her human mouth. She has the arms and wings of a bat, 
as well as cloven hoofs in place of her right foot. She doesn't allow anyone to get close enough to undo her shackles, but if her bonds are magically unlocked, or if her chains are somehow broken, she flies away and never returns. Mazina has the flight feature. Her madness is embodied in the following statement. I am convinced that powerful enemies are hunting me, and their agents are everywhere I go. I'm sure that they're watching me all the time. Area S13, the main hall. Gentle sounding music trickles down from above played on a single string instrument by some unseen master. The ground floor is one large 50 foot square room with arched leaded glass windows. A cauldron sits on an iron rack above a fire in a hearth, while above the fireplace mantel hangs a golden disc engraved with the symbol of the sun. In one corner, a wooden staircase climbs to the upper level, while in another, A cornerstone staircase descends into darkness. Several chairs surround a wooden table that stretches nearly the length of the room. The wooden dishware and golden candelabras are neatly arranged on the table, standing behind which is a young woman with alabaster skin, dressed in a torn and soiled red gown. Her auburn hair is neatly bundled so as to not touch her soft shoulders. She seems lost in her own thoughts. The abbot is normally here, and if he's here, add. A handsome young man in a brown monk's robe gently takes the woman by her hand. A painted wooden holly symbol that depicts the sun hangs from a chain around his neck. He moves with the grace of a saint. The abbot is a diva in disguise. He wears a holy symbol of the morning lord around his neck. The woman in the tattered red gown is Valsilka, a flesh golem that has been exquisitely put together to serve as Stride's bride. Characters within five feet of Valsilka can see the seams in her powdered skin where disparate body parts stolen from Kresek graves have been carefully stitched together. The abbot is teaching Valsilka the finer points of etiquette. He also intends to teach her how to dance. Valsilka obeys his every command. She can't speak, but lets loose an unholy scream if harmed. If driven berserk, she fights until the abbot reasserts control, or she is destroyed. She has supernatural strength of a typical flesh golem, despite her small size. The abbot has no desire to harm the characters. He knows that Strahd has brought them to Barovia for a reason, and he doesn't want to thwart Strahd's plan for them. His calm, pleasant demeanor changes if they become hostile, or if they threaten Valsilka. He sheds his disguise and assumes his true angelic form, hoping that the sight is enough to make them back down. The abbot would like to find a proper bridal gown for Valsilka. If the characters seem friendly, he asks them for help in locating one. In exchange, he offers his magic, agreeing to cast Ray's dead up to three times on their behalf or give them each the benefit of his healing touch. If they decline to help, or have behaved rudely, he orders them to leave the abbey at once, attacking them if they refuse, and doing his utmost to keep Valsilka safe. The music comes from upstairs in area S17. The stone staircase leads down to the wine cellar in area S16. The wooden stairs climb to the loft and belfry in area S17. The stew pot in the fireplace contains several gallons of hot turnip and rabbit soup, intended for the mongrel folk imprisoned in areas S12C and S15. Role playing the abbot. The abbot believes he is righteous. He regrets transforming the Bellevues into horrid mongrel folk, and he considers their imprisonment to be necessary to contain their madness. With regard to Strad's bride, He believes that she is the key to freeing the land from its curse. The insane abbot can't be convinced otherwise. The abbot shares his belief openly, claiming that his decisions are based on the morning lord's guidance. He will give visitors a tour of the abbey if they seem friendly, but he turns hostile if they threaten him or his charges. Treasure 
The Golden Sun disc hanging above the fireplace is worth 750 gold pieces. Taking the disc off the wall reveals a niche that contains a potion of superior healing in a crystal and electrum flask worth 250 gold pieces. Four gold candelabras, worth 250 gold pieces each, rest atop the table. If a player had the fortune of Ravenloft, the glyph of one, the monk, the treasure can be found here behind the golden disc hanging above the fireplace. Area S14, the foyer. This room used to be an office, as evidenced by the remains of a desk and chair, both of which have been smashed to pieces. A hallway to the south leads to a staircase going up. A dark passage to the east is full of unnatural whispers, mad laughter, and bestial odours. The stairs lead up to area S20. If the characters enter this area making noise or carrying light sources, the golem in area S15 is drawn to them, unless they have already defeated it. Area S15, the madhouse. This lightless corridor has multiple doors behind which lies creatures that shatter the quiet with their mad cackles and whispered curses. The stench is overpowering. Before he set out to create a bride for Strahd, the abbot tried his hand at creating a more rudimentary golem. This creature paces the halls tirelessly guarding the abbey's madhouse and making sure no mongrel folk escape. When the characters first see the golem, Read, even in the gloom you make out a monstrous shape lumbering down the hall. When the darkest can no longer hide its true nature, your eyes are treated to a terrifying seven-foot-tall assemblage of human body parts. This flesh golem attacks anyone who isn't in the company of the abbot or cloven Bellevue. None of the doors leading from the hall are locked. If the characters open any locks and look inside, they see that the rooms on each side of the hall are dimly lit by natural light that filters through dirty shuttered windows. The door at the east end of the hall leads outside and can be pulled open to reveal the gardens in area S9. The 60 mongrel folk confined here are fed at irregular intervals by cloven Bellevue. Dinner is foretold by the ringing of the Abbey Bell in area S17. These mongrel folk aren't restrained, but they refuse to leave their rooms for fear of being killed by the golem or cast out of the abbey and forced to fend for themselves. In addition to a dagger, each mongrel folk has its own wooden soup bowl. Area S15A Fearful Mongrel Folk This room was once a shared bedchamber, but its furnishings have been destroyed. Three shrieking mongrels cower in the shadowy northwest corner. One of them cradles something shiny. Three mongrel folk are confined here. One of them cradles a polished brass candlestick as if it was a doll. Any attempt to take it causes the mongrel folk to attack. Area S15B The Quarreling Mongrel Folk Four mongrel creatures brawl amid the wreckage of this bedchamber where a fifth watches and cackles behind a life-size, painted wooden statue of a saintly woman in robes. Five mongrel folk are confined here. The four that are fighting aren't trying to kill each other, but they are trying to assert dominance. They stop fighting if a character separates them. The statue is a little over five feet tall and carved from a single piece of wood. It depicts Saint Markovia. Close inspection reveals it is covered in bite marks. Area S15C The Encanting Mongrel Folk Seven mongrels are seated in the middle of this room that form a ring. They appear to be chanting a spell. The seven mongrel folk are trying to cast a spell that will cause the abbey's bell to ring so that dinner will be served. They are speaking non-magical gibberish. Area S15D The Hungry Mongrel Folk Nine mongrel creatures stand in the middle of this room, staring at the doorway in silence with hungry looks in their eyes. These nine mongrel folk haven't been fed in days because Cloven doesn't like them. They try to kill and devour any character who sets foot in the room. Area S15E, 
the mongrel folk hoard. This room is packed wall to wall with mongrels wallowing in their own filth. The floor is strewn with gnawed bones. Sixteen screaming mongrel folk confined here. The bones are all that remained of mongrel folk who have perished and eaten. The survivors beg for food. Area S15F The singing and dancing mongrel folk. Eight mongrels caper about in the wreckage of a bedchamber while singing a rhyme. One of them holds up a glittering gold statue as it leads a mad parade. The eight mongrel folk sing the following rhyme. The devil dwells in this dark house. A thunder misty filler. First he'll taste her sweet sweet blood, and then he'll have to kill her. They weep if their treasure is taken from them. The golden statuette depicts Saint Markovia and is worth 250 gold pieces. It grants any good aligned creature that carries it a plus one bonus to saving throws. Area S15G Mongol Folk Babies Filthy mongrels cradle screaming young in debris strewn corners of this room, while several more hoot and holler and roll on the floor and whack each other with sticks. This room contains ten mongrel folk, three of which are tending to non combatant mongrel folk babies. Area S15H The Mongrel Folk Fort. This room contains a fort made out of piles and bits of shattered furniture and torn draperies. From within the fort you hear a mischievous cackle. Two mongrel folk live in the fort, but they refuse to come out unless they're baited with food. While hidden under the wreckage they have three quarter cover. Area S16 The Wine Cellar The stone steps descend 20 feet to a cellar that contains 10 barrels of wine and an L-shaped wooden rack that is packed with wine bottles. The barrels in the centre of the room are empty. The wine names are emblazoned on the barrels, as is the winery's name, the Wizard of Wines. The barrels against the east wall contain Purple Great Marsh Number 3, a cheap wine. The four barrels against the south wall contain Red Dragon Crush, a fine wine. The wine racks contain 33 bottles of Purple Great Marsh Number 3 and 24 bottles of Red Dragon Crush. Treasure Among the wine bottles on the rack is one with no stopper and a label that reads Champagne de la Stomp. It contains a rolled up spell scroll of Hero's Feast. Area S17 The Loft and Belfry Anyone on the curtain wall from area S18, who listens at this room's door, hears the soft tones of a stringed instrument. The wooden stairs climb 20 feet to a loft with a pitched roof and a door in the centre of the south wall. Unlit lanterns hang from the rafters and a rope dangles from a bronze bell lodged in the belfry 30 feet overhead. The room is filled with the sound of beautiful music. A melody so enchanting that it adds a bit of much needed warmth to the otherwise freezing room. A black shroud covers a humanoid shape lying on a wooden table. The music does nothing to stir it. A cot heaped with furs rests in the northeast corner, surrounded by empty wine bottles. An oil lamp burns atop a table nearby, silhouetting a squat creature that has two heads. It sits on the edge of a cot with a viol between its legs. With a crustacean claw-like appendage, it grasps the neck of the instrument while running a bow gently across its strings with its human hand. This is the loft where the abbot creates his flesh golems. Needles, thread, saws and other tools lie on a small table in the northwest corner. If anyone rings the bell, a cacophony erupts from the courtyard in the east wing as a mongrel folk cry out, FOOD! The cries last until the creatures are fed. Cloven Bellevue, the abbot's manservant, a two-headed neutral evil mongrel folk, resides here. He plays the viol beautifully when he is drunk, and the music helps put his half-formed head to sleep. Hidden under the furs of his cot are three bottles of Purple Grape Marsh Number 3, Several empty bottles are strewn about the floor of the cot. Role-playing Cloven 
Cloven stands 4 feet 7 inches tall and has a barrel-like shape. His right head is fully formed and combines the features of a patchy-haired man with those of a goat, complete with stubby horns. His left head is about half the normal size and has a soft cherubic face, partly covered with a crocodilian hide. Cloven has a crab pincer in place of his left hand and a bear's paw where his right foot should be. He wears an ill-fitting monk's robe with a belt made of hempen rope. Cloven is the abbot's faithful marionette, but he is despised by the other mongrel folk who accuse him of hoarding food and slowly starving them to death. He would let them starve, but the abbot has forbidden it. Cloven has the two-headed feature. His madness is embodied in the following statement. Being drunk keeps me sane. He is drunk most of the time, but not to the extent that it impedes his combat ability, and his musical performance improves when he is inebriated. The larger head does all the talking. The smaller head has a forked snake's tongue and can't do anything except hiss and make other horrible sounds. It is worth noting that there is a teleport destination here. The characters who teleport from Castle Ravenloft in Area K-78 will arrive at the point marked T on the map. The thing on the table. If the characters lift the black shroud covering the larger table, read, Beneath the shroud lies a creature made of stitched together body parts. You recognize some of these parts as your own. The creature on the table appears to be made of the body parts of the characters, which of course cannot be. Strahd's will is playing a trick on them. If the character touches the horrid creature, its true appearance is revealed. Your eyes play tricks, but what truly lies atop the table are chopped up body parts. All of them taken from cold, grey, lifeless women, all waiting to be stitched together into something horrid. The body parts were plundered from graves in Kresek. They are leftovers, pieces the abbot didn't use in the creation of Strahd's Bride from Area S-13. Area S-18, the Curtain Wall Scarecrows line the abbey walls looking outwards. They wear tattered chain shirts and carry spears with rusty heads. The courtyard below is blanketed in fog. The scarecrows are lashed to wooden stands. Though fearsome at a distance, they have no life to them. It's a 15 foot drop from the top of the wall to the courtyard. Any creature that falls down the southwest wall tumbles 400 feet down the cliffside. Area S19, the barracks. Bunk beds that have disintegrated with age lie in heaps along the wall of this mouldy 30 foot square room. Long ago, the abbey employed guards to defend its walls, and they were quartered here. Hesmerelda Avnir. If the characters have not already encountered her elsewhere, the vampire hunter Esmeralda Avnir is here plotting her next move. Esmeralda of Istana is the protege of Rudolf van Richten. Despite the fact that her first encounter with the vampire hunter was anything but pleasant. A witness to tragedy. When Esmeralda was a little girl, her family kidnapped Van Richten's teenage son, Erasmus, and delivered him to the clutches of a vampire. Even today, years later, she can still hear Erasmus's pleas for mercy. That event haunted her childhood. Van Richten tracked down Esmeralda's family soon after the kidnapping, but not before the Vistani had sold the boy. Though Van Richten could have done them harm, he instead interrogated Esmeralda's mother and father on the whereabouts of his missing son. Satisfied with their answers, he spared their lives before departing with the information they had given him. Esmeralda witnessed Van Richten's act of mercy and was deeply moved by it. Van Richten's Tragic Tale At the age of 15, Esmeralda, still troubled by what her family had done to Van Richten, ran away from home. After many harrowing adventures, she tracked down Van Richten two years later. Thinking she was a Vistana assassin, he put a sword to her throat and threatened to spill her blood. Esmeralda convinced him that she genuinely wanted to help him find his missing son, whereupon Van Richten told her the saddest of tales. He had found his son, 
who had been transformed into a vampire spawn. When Ezramus pleaded to his father for salvation, Van Richten granted his request by ending his existence. A farewell. Esmeralda remained by Van Richten's side for two years, helping him track down and slay many creatures of the night. But because Van Richten could never bring himself to fully trust Avistana, he kept secrets from her. The two vampire hunters got on each other's nerves, and the arguments became more frequent. At last, Esmeralda suggests that they part company, with some shred of their friendship still intact, and Van Richten agreed. Esmeralda's Secret Since bidding farewell to Van Richten, Esmeralda has amassed a sizable personal fortune, some of which she used to buy a wagon to carry her vampire-slaying paraphernalia. On one of her less successful adventures, a werewolf bit off her right leg below the knee, and although she avoided being afflicted with lycanthropy, Esmeralda was sidelined for months. She commissioned a master artisan to craft a prosthetic leg and foot. After several tries, he delivered a prosthesis that restored her mobility. She has since adapted well to the false appendage, and takes care to hide it from view. The Great Vampire Hunt While in the company of the Vistani caravan, Esmeralda heard rumours that Rudolf van Richten had gone to Barovia to slay the most powerful vampire of them all. She decided that he might need help and travelled for months to reach Strahd's domain. She rode her wagon to Valakai and learned about an old tower that seemed to be the sort of place van Richten would use as a base. When she arrived there, she found some of van Richten's belongings, but of the vampire hunter there was no sign. Although she is anxious to learn the whereabouts of her mentor, she is also eager to earn his trust and respect. To that end, she has been poring over Van Richten's research and learning about Strahd and Castle Ravenloft with every intention of dispatching the vampire herself. Esmeralda also keeps a deck of Taroka cards in her wagon, from Chapter 11, Area V1. Although the cards aren't magical, Esmeralda can use them to perform a card reading for the characters just like that performed by Madame Ava. Esmeralda Avner's Traits Her ideal is that evil that feeds on the innocent is the worst of all evils and must be destroyed. Her bond is her mentor and teacher, Dr. Van Richten, who is like a father to her. And her flaw is, I go where the angels fear to tread. Esmeralda is a formidable opponent in combat. She casts spells like a wizard and also has the ability to fight just like a fighter. The following are her prepared spells. Her cantrips are Firebolt, Light, Mage Hand, and Prestigitation. Her first level spells, which she has four slots of, are Protection from Good and Evil, Magic Missile, and Shield. Her second level spells, which she has three slots of, is Dark Vision, Knock, and Mirror Image. Her third level spells, which she has three slots of, is Clairvoyance, Lightning Bolt, and Magic Circle. And her fourth level spell, which she has one of, is Greater Invisibility. She also possesses the power of a Vistana, allowing her to curse others. Esmeralda crept into Krezek unseen under the cover of darkness, and made her way to the Abbey, in hopes of gaining knowledge about Strahd and his domain from the residents here. Having met the abbot and Strahd's bride, in Area S13, Esmeralda realizes the abbot is insane. The abbot told her that he is expecting Strahd to visit his bride-to-be. Esmeralda has decided to wait for the vampire to come, so that she can destroy him away from Castle Ravenloft, far from his resting place. She is planning to create a magic circle in this room as an added precaution. As the abbot's guest, Esmeralda is free to come and go as she pleases. If the characters seem committed to fighting Strahd, she abandons her plan and offers to join forces with them. Area S20, the upstairs office. A wooden counter shaped like an L stands at the front of this spacious office. All the other furniture has rotted away, leaving heaps of moldy wood and faded cloth. The wood of this counter is old, soft, and easily broken. Nothing of value remains here. If the characters haven't already cleared out the madhouse in Area S15, they can hear the whoops and laughter and screams of the mongrel folks below. 
The clamor continues as they explore the areas S21 to areas S24 to the east. Area S21, the haunted hospital. This spacious chamber contains bed frames of wrought iron arranged in two neat rows. Cobweb and bits of rotting mattress cling to each frame. Three doors are spaced along the southern wall. Each has a plaque mounted on it. From west to east, the plaque reads, Operating Room, Nursery, and Morgue. Six shadows haunt this room. They are the remnants of dark souls that perished here long ago. The creatures wait until one or more characters are at least ten feet inside the room before moving out from within the normal shadows to attack. The shadows can't leave this room. Area S22, The Operating Room. A bloodstained table stands in the middle of this otherwise empty room. The first time a character touches the table, read, A scream fills the room, a scream that echoes through time. It is followed by another, fainter screams of those who died under the knife. The screams fade, until they are nothing more than haunting memories. There is nothing of value here. Area S23, The Nursery. This room contains the wreckage of old wooden cribs. If the characters search the room, one of them, determined randomly, sees a figure reflected in the window glass, a nun in white robes, standing in the doorway. A look back towards the door reveals nothing's there, and the reflection can't be seen again. If a character had the fortune of Ravenloft, the two of coins, the philanthropist, the treasure can be found here in one of the wrecked cribs. Area S24, The Morgue. A raven perches on the windowsill of this otherwise empty room. If the characters approach the raven, it flies to the shoulder of the nearest scarecrow in the garden in Area S9. A character who kills the raven is cursed. While cursed, the character has disadvantage on all attack rolls and ability checks. A greater restoration spell, a remove curse spell, or similar effect ends the curse. The following are special events that occur within the Abbey as they explore Kresek. Something old. This event can occur if the characters don't or can't raise the Burgomaster's son, Ilya, from the dead. If alive, the abbot learns that Ilya died recently and, in his human guise, visits the Burgomaster's cottage. If one or more of the characters are staying there, they hear a knock at the door. Without bothering to introduce himself, the abbot tells the burgomaster and his wife that he wants to raise their son from the dead. He claims that the gods of light want Kreskov's bloodline restored. The characters can try to intervene in the raising of Ilya Kreskov. Otherwise, the burgomaster digs up his son's corpse. Without needing the requisite material components, the abbot casts Ray's dead, returning Ilya to life with one hit point. Anna Kreskova praises the abbot and Saint Markovia for his generous act before tending to her son. The burgomaster, his grief dispelled, fears that he misjudged the abbot and has no way to repay him for this supreme act of kindness. Ilya Kresov returns to life with a random form of indefinite madness, as described in Chapter 8 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. The abbot uses this raising of Ilya as leverage to get the burgomaster to undertake an unusual request, which is to be explained later during the Something Borrowed event. The Something New event. The characters learn that a Kresite woman named Demira Yulinsky, a lawful good female human non-combatant, is about to give birth. A local midwife named Kretiana Dolov, a lawful good female human commoner, is summoned to the mother's cottage to deliver the newborn. In the absence of a priest, the burgomaster's wife, Anna Kreskovia, is called upon to supervise the blessed event and offer prayers for the health of the mother and the child. Dimaria gives birth to a healthy baby boy, but the baby doesn't cry. While the mother coddles the infant, characters who succeed on a DC-10 wisdom insight check can see that Kretiana is deeply troubled if the characters question the midwife, she tells them in confidence, That child has no soul. Very sad. 
Christiana is raised to believe that newborns are soulless if they don't cry, and she has come to believe it rightly that most Barovians lack souls. The Something Borrowed event The abbot needs a bridal gown. He doesn't trust the Mongol folk to find one, so he pays a visit to the Burgomaster Kresov and instructs him to obtain a gown within a month, either as compensation for raising his dead son, or on the pain of death. No one in Kresek can fashion such a gown, leaving the Burgomaster no choice but to look elsewhere. His wife, Anna, says they should personally lead a well-armed group of Kresites to the east to Valakai. Anna Kreskovia, a lawful good female human noble, bids her husband farewell and leaves with two guards, four commoners, and a mule laden with provisions. If the characters are present, the Burgomaster urges them to provide escort. If they agree, check for random encounters that they make along the way on the old Salovich Road as normal. If the guards at Valakai's gate can be convinced to let them in, Anna and the characters can begin searching for a bridal gown or dressmaker. Local dressmakers are willing to fashion a gown for 50 gold pieces, but Anna can't afford it, and the dress won't be finished in time. The dressmakers are quick to point out that the Baroness, Lydia Petrovna, the wife of Valakai's burgomaster, owns a beautiful white bridal gown, which you can explore further in Chapter 5 in Area N3P. The Baroness is eager to please, and is willing to give up her dress for a good cause, although her husband won't allow it, and could care less for Kresek's problems. If the characters don't accompany Anna on her quest, her expedition falls prey to the perils of the wilderness, and never returns. Trezov sends more villagers to find them, and the villagers are also lost. Unwilling to risk any more lives, Trezov visits the abbey for the first time in his life, and makes a desperate plea to the abbot, who ignores the plea. Characters can escort the burgomaster to the abbey, or eavesdrop on the burgomaster's conversation with the abbot. If they do, they can hear the abbot promise divine retribution as punishment. The evening after the burgomaster's visit, the abbot releases all the mongrel folk in the abbey's madhouse, in area S15, and sets them on the village. They steal pigs, chickens, and anything else that's edible. None of the villagers are harmed, but their food supplies are depleted, and 2d6 mongrel folk are killed. The surviving mongrel folk return to the abbey with their plunder. The burgomaster is so distraught that he hangs himself from the rafters of his cottage a few days later. The characters can stop all this from happening by delivering the dress to the abbot. They can also stop the mayhem by halting the mongrel folk as they descend from the abbey, or by killing the abbot beforehand. If Lydia Petrovna's bridal gown is delivered to the abbot, he honours whatever deal he made with the characters. If the characters resort to magical trickery, for example creating an illusionary dress, the abbot becomes hostile towards them once the deception is revealed. The Something Blue event This encounter occurs if the character bring Eilina Kolyana to Kresek, as the priest Donovish suggested back in Barovia in Chapter 3, Area E5F. Irina hears a gentle voice calling to her. It leads her to the edge of the blessed pool in area S4. If the characters follow her, read, As Irina reaches the pool's edge, an image appears in sparkling blue waters, a handsome youth of kind and noble visage. The sadness in his eyes turns to sudden joy. Tatiana, he says, It has been so long. Come, my love, let us be together at last. Irina gasps and puts a hand on her heart. My beloved Sergi, in life you are a prince and a man of faith. We were to be married long ago. Has this blessed pool called your spirit to me? She reaches towards the water's surface as a hand of water rises up to take hers. If the characters intervene, pulling Irina away from the water's grasp, the hand sinks back into the pool. Sergi's image fades and she cries and screams his name. If the characters allow her to take the hand, read, Irina is pulled into the pool and embraces Sergi beneath the rippling water. You have never seen a happier couple as they both begin to fade from view.
The spirit of Sergi takes Arena to the place where Strahd can't harm her. She is safe with him. Whether or not Sergi takes Irina, Strahd senses the two have found each other, and he reacts as follows. A peal of thunder shakes the land, and dark clouds coalesce into terrible visage. A deep, dark voice from beyond the mountain cries out, She is mine! A terrible crack resounds as blue lightning splits the sky and strikes the pool. Each creature within 15 feet of the pool must make a successful DC-17 dexterity check or be knocked prone. The blast knocks down the old gazebo as well. A creature in the water when the lightning strikes must make a DC-17 constitution saving throw, taking 44 or 8d10 lightning damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. Strahd's wrath destroys the blessing on the pool and renders the water non-magical, preventing the spirit of Sergi from manifesting in there again. If Sergi and Irina are brought together, Irina is no longer within Strahd's grasp. Strahd blames the characters for his loss and seeks to destroy them from this moment on. Not long afterward, he has one of his servants deliver a letter to the characters, inviting them to Castle Ravenloft. If the characters open and read the letter, show the players Strahd's invitation. If the characters head towards the castle, they have no threatening random encounters on the way. Chapter 9 Toslenka Pass Toslenka Pass is a gravel road that hugs Mount Gacchus, climbing to great heights. The road starts at the Raven River Crossroads in Chapter 2 Area R and travels 7 miles to a gatehouse area T1 to T3, and a guard tower in areas T4 to T6, as well as a stone bridge in area T7 to T9 that spans the Luna River. Wind and snow make the journey treacherous. Without some way to keep warm, characters who aren't dressed for cold weather suffer the effects of extreme cold at night, as explained in the Dungeon Master's Guide in Chapter 5. The Areas of the Pass the following areas correspond to labels on the map of Toslenka Pass. These structures are made of tightly fitted stone and can't be scaled without the aid of magic or a climber's kit. Area T1, the Gatehouse Portcullis. When the characters approach from the west, read, The shelf of the rock on which the mountain road clings grows narrow. To your left, the icy cliffs rise sharply towards dark rolling clouds. To your right, the ground falls away into a sea of fog. Ahead, through the wind and snow, you see a high wall of black stone lined with spikes and topped with statues of demonic vultures with horned heads. Set in the center of the wall is a closed iron portcullis, behind which burns a curtain of green flame. On the other side of the dark wall, gripping the mountain's edge, is a guard's tower of white stone topped by golden statues of mighty warriors. The gatehouse is 30 feet high, the adjoining walls are 20 feet high and lined with stone spikes. If the characters circumvent the gate by flying or climbing over it, the statues on the gatehouse in area T2 animate and attack. If the characters approach within 10 feet of the portcullis, it shrieks with the sound of metal on metal as it rises on its own. It stays open for one minute, and then closes. Area T2, the demon statues. These statues are actually two petrified rocks. If they are attacked, or if the characters bypass the gatehouse, the rocks refer to flesh and attack, pursuing prey that flees and fighting until slain. Area T3, the curtain of green flame. A curtain of green flame fills the eastern archway of the gatehouse. Any creature that enters the curtain for the first time on a turn or starts its turn in the green flame takes 33 or 60 10 fire damage. A successful casting of Dispel Magic at a DC of 16 suppresses the curtain for one minute. The curtain is also suppressed within an anti-magic field. Area T4, the guard tower, ground floor. The tower door is made of iron-bound wood and barred from within. A character can force open the door with a successful DC-22 strength athletics check. A cold hearth stands across from the door. The wind howls down its chimney. 
A stone staircase is on the south wall. Three windows look out over the foggy sea. The stairs climb 20 feet to area T5. A special area to note is the teleport destination. If characters are in Castle Ravenloft in area K78, they will arrive on the point marked X on the map. Area T5, the guard tower upper floor. The upper level of the tower is an ice box with windows set in almost every wall. A rusted iron ladder bolted to the floor and ceiling leads up to a wooden trap door. Mounted above the stone hearth is a dire wolf's head, and the wind coming down the chimney howls in its stead. The trap door in the ceiling pushes open with a squeal, revealing the rooftop, area T6, and the stormy grey sky. Area T6, the guard tower rooftop. Ten foot tall gold-plated statues stand atop the battlements, facing outward. Each one depicts a female human knight holding a lance. The cold wind stirs the snow, under which you see human skeletons clad in rusty mail. The roof is 40 feet high and 540 feet above the misty valley below. A wooden trap door in the floor squeals as it is pulled open, revealing area T5 below. The skeletons are the remains of four guards who held this post long ago. Characters who search the remains find tattered bits of cloth, broken longbows and arrows, rusted blades in ruined sheaths, and rusty chainmail. If a character had the fortune of Ravenloft, the Three of Swords, the soldier, the following occurs. The swirling snow assumes the forms of thin young women. The wind howls. Be gone! The treasure is ours! The forms are six snow maidens. Use the spectre statistics with the following modifications. The snow maidens have immunity to cold damage. The snow maiden's life drain attack deals cold damage instead of necrotic damage. The snow maidens don't speak, nor are they interested in hearing what the characters have to say. If the characters don't leave at once, the snow maidens attack. When the last snow maiden is defeated, the treasure that the characters seek magically appears in the swirling snow of the rooftop. Area T7, the Western Arch. When the characters approach the bridge, read, the snowy pass comes to a gorge spanned by a stone bridge. At the end of the bridge is a 30 foot tall, 30 foot wide stone arch. Atop each one are two statues of armoured knights on horseback with lances, charging towards one another. The wind bites and howls like wolves as it passes through the gorge. The western arch contains empty guard posts, one on each side of the bridge. These ten-foot-wide chambers provide some protection against the howling wind. Area T8, the Stone Bridge. A black-cloaked rider on a charcoal-coloured horse guards the middle of the bridge. The cloaked rider is a manifestation of Strad von Zarevich, a grim warning to proceed no further. If the characters interact with the manifestation in any way, the rider and horse disperse like ash in the wind. 500 feet below the bridge is the Lunar River, barely visible through the fog. Though slippery in a few places, the 10 foot wide, 90 foot long bridge is safe to cross. Area T9, the Eastern Arch. One of the statues atop this arch has crumbled, leaving only the hindquarters of the horse intact. The mountain pass continues beyond. This arch contains a 10 foot square guard post, one on each side of the bridge. Both rooms are empty. Beyond this arch, Toslenka Pass hugs the mountain for three miles before branching north and south. The northern branch leads to the Amber Temple in Chapter 13, and the southern branch continues to wrap around Mount Gacchus until it ends at the deadly fog that surrounds Barovia. The following are special events that can occur along Toslenka Pass. The Rock of Mount Gacchus as the characters cross the stone bridge in area T8, from east to west, possibly on their way back from the Amber Temple in chapter 13, they are spotted by a rock that has survived in the mountain for thousands of years. The rock has a great nest on top of Mount Gacchus to the southeast, and feeds on fish in the nearby lake. When the rock of Mount Gacchus appears, read, 
diving towards the bridge is a creature of unearthly size, a bird so monstrous that its wings blot out the sky. The rock attacks a random creature on the bridge, snatching up a horse or mule if one is available. Otherwise, it attacks a party member. It can't reach the characters who hide in the guard post at either end of the bridge. If it has nothing to attack on its turn, the rock lets loose a horrible shriek and flies back to its nest. The Bloodhorns Charge As the characters make their way along Toslanka Pass, they encounter a beast that the druids and berserkers of Barovia called Sangzor, or Bloodhorn. The road ahead is cut out of the mountainside, rising steeply to one side and falling away on the other. Mist and snow greatly reduce visibility, and the howling wind cuts through you like a knife. If no character has a passive wisdom perception score of 16 or higher, the party is surprised. Otherwise, read. A nine foot tall goat stands atop a crag above you, its grey fur blending perfectly with the rock of the mountainside. It lowers its head, and malice glimmers in its eyes. Sangzor is a giant goat known for its supernatural resistance and evil disposition. Mountain folk have been hunting it for years. Modify its statistics as follows. It has an intelligence of 6 and its chaotic evil. It has 33 hit points. It has resistance to bludgeon, piercing and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. Its challenge rating is 1, worth 200 experience. The giant goat charges down the mountainside using its charge feature and rams a character. If the attack hits and the target fails its saving throw, it is sent tumbling down the mountainside, falling a hundred feet onto a ledge. The goat flees if it takes 10 damage or more. The mist and snowfall prevent seeing anything more than 60 feet away. Once the goat is out of sight, it disappears through a cleft. If characters are able to slay Sangzor, they can take its pelt, and this commands a respect of the berserkers who inhabit Strahd's domain. The berserkers will not attack a character that wears Sangzor's pelt or its companions unless they're provoked. Chapter 11 Van Richten's Tower One of the men employed by Strahd to raise Castle Ravenloft was an arch wizard named Kazan. After his work on the castle was complete, Kazan retired to the Perovian Valley and built a tower for himself on a small island on Lake Baratok. With the help of some engineers and some labourers, he also built an earth and gravel causeway connecting the island to the nearby shore. In his waning years, Kazan visited the Amber Temple in Chapter 13 and discovered the secret to becoming a lich. He returned to his tower and was able to complete the transformation. Some years later, after Strahd became a vampire, Kazan paid a visit to Castle Ravenloft with the notion of challenging Strahd for rulership of Barovia. Instead, much to Kazan's surprise, Strahd persuaded him to serve him as an advisor in matters of magic. When not advising Strahd, the Lich spent most of its time in the Amber Temple, trying to master the secrets of Demi-Lichdom in a hope of finding a way to magically project his spirit beyond the confines of Strahd's realm. His efforts failed, and Kazan destroyed himself. His remains lie entombed in the catacombs of Ravenloft. Kazan's tower stood empty for ages it seemed, and would have collapsed under the weight of neglect were it not for the magic wards placed on it long ago. Recently, the tower was taken over by a legendary vampire hunter, Rudolf van Richten, who used it as a base in which to explore Barovia. He has since relocated to a town nearby Valakai, where he hides in plain sight. Following in the vampire hunter's footsteps is his protege, Esmeralda Avnir, who has taken on living in the tower while she searches for a mentor. She isn't present when the characters arrive, however. Approaching the tower. The Salovich woods have swallowed up the road that once led to the tower. Now only a wide dirt trail remains. You come to a cold mountain lake, enclosed by misty woods and rocky bluffs. The thick fog creeps along the dark still waters. The trail ends at a grass-covered causeway that stretches a hundred yards across from the lake to a flat, marshy island with a stone tower on it. The tower is old and decrepit, with collapsing scaffolds clinging to one side where a large gash has split the wall. Time-worn griffin statues, their wings and flanks covered in moss, 
perch atop the buttresses that support the walls. Parked near the base of the tower, within sight of the entrance, is a barrel-topped wagon spotted with mud. The tower stands 80 feet tall. It has four levels, each 20 feet high, and a mostly intact slate tile roof. The second, third, and fourth floors have arrow slits that are six inches wide, three feet tall, and one foot thick. The tower's uppermost level overhangs the levels below it, and has a windowed box in addition to its arrow slits. The mossy griffins atop the buttresses are nothing more than decorative statues. Kazan's Spell Train Kazan warded his tower so that he alone could cast spells near or within it. The effect is identical to an anti-magic field, centred on the tower and extending five feet from it in all directions. The effect doesn't apply to magic traps and constructs created by Kazan, including the trap on the tower door in Area V2, the golems in Area V4, and the animated suits of armor in Area V7. The following areas correspond to labels on the map of Van Richten's tower. Area V1, Esmeralda's Magic Wagon. Esmeralda's wagon is parked in front of the tower. If the characters investigate the wagon, read, Under layers of mud, this wagon sports a fresh coat of purple paint, and its wheels have a fancy gold trim. A brass lantern hangs from each corner, and a red drape covers a tombstone-shaped window on each side. A steel padlock secures the back door, hanging from which is a cheap wooden sign that reads, KEEP OUT! The wagon radiates an aura of conjuration magic if it is scrutinized with a detect magic spell. A character who casts Identify on the wagon learns the command word needed to operate it. Anyone who sits in the driver's seat and speaks its command word, Dravash, summons a pair of quasi-real draft horses, which are magically tethered to the wagon and can't be separated from it. The horses and the wagon have a speed of 30 feet, and the horses heed the driver's simple commands. The driver can dismiss the horses with the second command word, Arvesh. The horses can be dispelled with a DC-15 check, but not harmed. The wagon has a hidden trap door in its underbelly that can be detected by a character who scuttles under the wagon and succeeds on a DC-13 wisdom perception check. The trap door opens into the wagon and is the only safe way inside. The inside handle of the door has a wire looped around it, and the wire is connected to a flask of alchemist fire hanging from the wagon ceiling. When the door is opened, the flask falls and explodes, igniting 100 more flasks of alchemist fire that dangle from the wires like ornaments along the wagon's interior walls. A creature within 30 feet of the wagon when it explodes must succeed on a DC-12 constitution saving throw, taking 55 or 10d10 fire damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. Creatures inside the wagon or within 5 feet of it have disadvantage on the saving throw. The wagon is reduced to flinders by the explosion, and the contents of the wagon are destroyed as well. A character inside the wagon spots the trap automatically, with no ability check required, and can disable it with a successful DC-10 dexterity check. A failed attempt to disable the trap triggers it. The interior of the wagon contains the following items. A wooden trunk covered with claw marks that holds a battle axe, a flail, a morning star, a light crossbow, and ten silvered crossbow bolts. A narrow wardrobe containing three sets of fine clothes, two sets of traveler's clothes, several pairs of shoes, a harlequin mask, and three wigs. A climber's kit, a disguise kit, a healer's kit, and a poisonous kit. A lyre with golden strings worth fifty gold pieces. A sculpted wooden cage holding a chicken and a silver ewer, worth 100 gold pieces, and five chicken eggs in it. A tiny wooden box containing a deck of taroga carts, wrapped in silk. A set of copper pots and pans worth 50 gold pieces. Three sets of manacles. A shovel. A wooden chest containing a gold holy symbol of the Morning Lord, worth 100 gold pieces. Three vials of holy water three vials of perfume, 
two vials of antitoxin, a 50-foot coil of hempen rope, a tinderbox, a steel mirror, a sharpened wooden stake, and a spyglass. Two spell scrolls, one of Major Image and one of Remove Curse. A map of Barovia, a charred page from Van Richten's journal. The journal reads, For more than three decades now, I have undertaken to investigate and expose creatures of darkness to the purifying light of truth and knowledge. Hero I am named in some circles. Sage and Master Hunter I am called in others. That I have survived countless supernatural assaults is seen as a marvel among my peers. My name is spoken with fear and with loathing among my foes. In truth, this virtuous calling began as an obsessive effort to destroy a vampire that murdered my child, and it has become for me a tedious and bleak career. Even as my life of hunting monsters began, I felt a weight of time on my shoulders. Today I am a man who has simply lived too long. Like a regretful lich, I find myself inexecrably bound to an existence I sought out of madness and, seemingly, must now endure it for all eternity. Of course, I shall die. But whether I shall ever rest in my grave haunts my idle thoughts and torments me in my dreams. I expect that those who think me a hero will change their minds when they know the whole truth about my life as a hunter of the unnatural. Nevertheless, I must reveal, here and now, that I have been the indirect yet certain cause of many deaths and the loss of many good friends. Mistake me not, I do not merely feel sorry for myself, rather, to come to grips with a devastating realization. Now see that I am an object of a baleful Vistani curse. More tragically than the nature of this hex is such that I have not borne the brunt of it. Instead, far worse, those who surround me have fallen victim to it. I have related this tragic story of how my only child, Isramus, was taken by Vistani and sold to a vampire. I explained how Isramus was made a minion of the Night Stalker and how it was my miserable part to free him from that fate at the point of a stake. What I have neglected to illuminate before is how I tracked Esmeris' kidnapper across the land, or how I extracted Esmeris' whereabouts from them. In fact, the Vistani took Esmeris with my own, unwitting permission. They had brought an extremely ill member of their tribe to me one evening, and they insisted that I treat him but I was unable to save the young man's life. In fear of their retribution, I begged the Vistani to take anything of mine if only they would withhold their terrifying powers, of which I knew nothing. To my lasting astonishment, they chose to surreptitiously take my son in exchange for their loss. By the time I had realized what had occurred, they were already an hour gone. Incensed beyond reason, I strapped the body of the dead young man to my horse and doggedly followed the Vistani caravan through the woods, naively allowing the sun to set before me without seeking shelter for the night. Shortly after darkness fell, I was beset by undead that would have slain me had it not been for their master, a lich that intervened and spared my life, for reasons that I do not completely understand. He somehow detected me, and with his powerful magic took control of a pack of zombies that wandered into the forest. He spoke to me through the mouths of the dead things, and placed a magic word against the undead on me, and then animated the dead Vistana, and bade it to tell me where I could find its people. Unfortunately, I say in hindsight, the plan worked. I found the child stealers, and my unwelcome entourage included a growing horde of voracious undead that could not touch me thanks to the lich's ward. When I found the caravan, I threatened to set the zombies on the Vistani, unless they returned my dear boy. They replied that he had been sold to a vampire. Baron Metis. Something inside me snapped. I released the zombies, and the entire tribe was eaten alive. Yet, the story has not ended. Before she died, the leader cursed me, saying, Live you always among monsters, and see everyone you live beneath their claws. Even now, so many years later, 
I can hear her words with painful clarity. A short time later, I found my dear Zerus made into a vampire. He begged me to end his curse, which I did with a heavy heart. The darkness had torn him from my loving arms forever, and I foolishly believed that the curse had exacted its deadly toll. I wept until an insatiable desire for vengeance filled the bottomless rift in my heart. Area V2, The Tower Door The tower door is made of iron with no visible handles or hinges. In the middle of the door is a large embossed symbol. It connects a series of lines with eight stick figures set around it. Carved into the lintel above the door is the word Kazan. Show the players the door symbol seen here. The door is magically locked and trapped, and the symbol on the door is the key to disabling the trap. Magic that would normally unlock the door is neutralized by the tower's spell drain effect as described earlier. A creature that touches the door without first disabling the trap causes lightning to envelop the tower. Any creature outside the tower and within 10 feet of it must succeed on a DC 15 dexterity saving throw, with disadvantage if it's wearing armor made out of metal, taking 22 or 4d10 lightning damage on a failed save or half damage on a successful one. As long as the effect persists, any creature that enters the lightning for the first time on a turn, or starts its turn there, takes 22 or 40 10 lightning damage. The lightning lasts for 10 minutes. The third time the trap is triggered, the magic fails and causes the tower to collapse. Each creature inside the tower when it collapses, takes 132 or 24 d10, bludgeoning damage, while those within 20 feet of the tower must succeed on a DC 15 dexterity saving throw, or take 44 or 8d10 bludgeoning damage from falling debris. The collapse not only destroys the tower, but also most of its contents, including the animated armor in Area V7. The wooden chest in Area V7, as well as its severed head, remains intact but requires 1d8 plus 2 hours of digging through the rubble in order to find it. The clay golem and area v4 are undamaged but buried under pile of debris. Every hour the characters spend searching through the rubble, they have a 10% chance of unearthing a berserk clay golem. Each stick figure embossed on the door has differently positioned arms, either bent up or down at the elbow or sticking straight out to the side. When a creature stands within five feet of the door and uses an action to imitate the arm positions of all eight stick figures in the proper sequence, the trap is disabled. The door swings open on rusty hinges for 10 minutes. The lines of the symbol on the door reveal the proper sequence. The dance can be performed in one of two ways. A creature must trace the path of the lines starting at either end point. All eight sets of arm positions must be performed with no repeats for the sequence to be complete. If the arm positions are done out of order, a young blue dragon magically appears within 30 feet of the door and attacks all creatures it can see. The characters can keep trying to open the door while the dragon is attacking them. The dragon disappears if it is reduced to zero hit points or the characters open the door. Beyond the five-foot door is a vestibule with a tattered curtain that conceals the area V4 beyond. The iron door leading outside can be safely opened from this side. It magically closes after one minute unless held open. Area V3, Rickety Scaffolding. Rotten wooden beams support the scaffolding, which groans and creaks with the slightest breeze. A series of ladders and platforms lead to a hole in the northwest of the wall on the third floor. The scaffolding can't support more than 200 pounds of weight. If it collapses, anyone standing on it falls 20 feet to the ground, taking 1d6 bludgeoning damage per 10 feet fallen, plus an additional 2d6 piercing damage from the debris. A creature underneath the scaffolding must succeed on a DC 13 dexterity saving throw or take 14 or 4d6 bludgeoning damage from falling debris. Area V4, 
the tower's first floor. The flagstone floor is strewn with debris, and a few old crates stand near the east wall. A torn curtain to the south partially obscures the tower's vestibule. A five-foot square indentation in the centre of the floor contains four pulleys attached to taut iron chains that stretch up through a similarly sized hole in the rotten wooden ceiling. Standing next to the chains are four tall clay statues. The four statues are clay golems that defend themselves if attacked. Otherwise, their sole purpose is to operate the elevator, which they do by pulling on the chains. The chains attach to five foot square wooden platform that normally rests on the fourth floor. If it appears that a creature wants to use the elevator, the golems lower the platform, then raise it to whichever level the creature specifies. They also heed commands issued from above. They obey only commands having to do with raising and lowering the elevator. The elevator isn't a smooth ride. The platform rises or lowers five feet per round, and its movements are jerky. If even one clay golem is destroyed, the remaining golems can no longer operate the elevator and remain motionless until attacked. The crates in this room are empty. Area V5, the tower's second floor. Dust and cobwebs fill this otherwise empty room. The wooden floor here is badly rotten and partially collapsed. In the middle of the room is a five foot square hole in the floor and ceiling, with a rusty chain near each corner. The chains are part of the tower's elevator mechanism. The five foot square sections of floor that surround the central shaft are weak. Each five foot section can support 150 pounds. Any more weight causes a section to collapse. Any creature standing on that section falls 20 feet to the ground floor. Area V6, the tower third floor. Time and the elements have all but destroyed this chamber, leaving a gash in the northwest wall and slimy black mildew on the walls. The wooden floor is completely rotted and has begun to fall away in places. In the middle of the room is a five foot square hole in the floor and ceiling, with rusty chains near each corner. The chains are part of the tower's elevator mechanism. The five foot square section of the floor that surrounds the central shaft are weak. Each five foot section can support 50 pounds. Any more weight causes the section to collapse and any creatures standing on that section fall 40 feet to the ground floor, smashing through the second floor on their way down. Area V7, the tower's fourth floor. Unlike the levels below, this room shows signs of recent habitation. Although the place reeks of mold and mildew, it has plenty of creature comforts, including a cozy bed, a desk of matching chair, bright tapestries, a large iron stove with plenty of wood to feed it. Light enters through arrow slits as well as through dirt cake windows with broken shutters. Other features of the room include a standing suit of armor and a wooden chest. Old wooden rafters bend under the weight of the tower of the roof, which has somehow remained intact. Mounted to the rafters are pulleys around which iron chains hang that support the lower elevator platform. Van Richten spent several months in this room, reviewing a lifetime's worth of research on Strad von Zarevich. Notes that, once he committed to memory, he burned in the stove. He also burned his journals. Esmeralda searched the room, hoping to find a clue about her mentor's plans or whereabouts. Among the things she found were a rolled up map of Barovia and a burnt page from Van Richten's journal, which she took and hid in her wagon in Area V1. The standing suit of armor is an animated armor. It is incapacitated until someone speaks the command word, Kazan, within 10 feet of it, whereupon the armor follows the commands of the ones who activated it. If 24 hours pass without receiving new instructions from its controller, the animated armor becomes incapacitated until someone reactivates it. If it is reduced to zero hit points, the armor falls to pieces and is destroyed. A lavender aroma emanates from the wooden chest, which is unlocked and safe to open. It contains the severed head of a human Vistana named Yarn. Its flesh has a waxy complexion and has been embalmed with magic oils. 
if a speak with dead spell is cast on this head, which would need to be taken somewhere away from the tower's spell drain effect before it can occur, Yarn reveals that he was banished from his clan for stealing. A half-elf bard named Rictavio offered Yarn a ride on his carnival wagon. The two travelled together for several days, but their time together was tense. When it was clear that Rictavio was looking for the road to Barovia, Yarn tried to steal the wagon as well as Rictavio's pet monkey, but Rictavio got the better of him and drove his sword through his gullet. The magic oils preserving Yarn's head allow it to remember conversations it has had while under the effect of Speak With Dead. Rictavio has cast Speak With Dead on the head twice before to ask questions about the Vistani of Barovia. Yarn believes that the half-elf plans to cause great harm to the Vistani and begs the characters to warn his people. He doesn't know where his body is. If one of the players has the fortunes of Ravenloft, the Master of Stars, the Wizard, the treasure is here. It is hidden in a narrow compartment in the wall beside the suit of armor. If the armor is activated and the command is to retrieve the treasure, it pulls out the stones of the wall, revealing the treasure beyond. If the characters have collapsed the tower, they find the treasure after 1d8 plus 2 hours of searching the rubble. For each hour they spend searching, they have a 10% chance to accidentally unearth a clay golem that withstood the collapse. The golem, which took no damage from the collapsing tower, is berserk and attacks until destroyed. The following are special events that can take place while exploring Van Richten's tower. Pack attack. If the characters blew up Esmeralda's wagon, activated the lightning sheath around the tower, or caused the tower to collapse, the sound of their handiwork echoes through the valley as far west as Krezek and as far east as Valakai. The disturbance attracts the attention of a pack of werewolves, which arrive after one hour. The werewolves hunt the Salovich woods west of Van Richten's tower. They come running in wolf form, hoping to catch up with prey trapped on the island by cutting off the access to the causeway. Leading the hunt is Kirill Stoyanovich, a werewolf with 90 hit points. Accompanying him are six normal werewolves and nine wolves. While in wolf form, the werewolves are indistinguishable from ordinary wolves. They either remain in wolf form or assume hybrid form. The werewolves know that the tower has magical defenses, so they are cautious. Kirill tries to lure the characters outside for the final showdown, but pulls his pack back into the woods if the characters start lobbing spells or making ranged attacks from the tower. A captured werewolf can be forced to divulge the whereabouts of the children kidnapped by the pack. They are being held in a cave to the west, in the werewolf den, as described in chapter 15. Esmeralda's Retreat Esmeralda Avnir returns to Van Richten's tower after confronting Strahd in the castle Ravenloft and barely escapes with her life. She arrives on the back of a riding horse stolen from the Vistani camp outside Valakai in Chapter 5. Esmeralda hopes that the arsenal of weapons in her wagon will be enough to protect her from the vampire's wrath. If the characters blew up the wagon, she is understandably annoyed and retreats to the tower. She knows how to bypass the trap on the tower door. If the tower has also been destroyed, she doesn't stick around unless the characters are clearly her best hope for survival. Esmeralda's altercation with Strahd has left her with only 30 hit points. She graciously accepts any healing the characters have to offer. From this moment on, Strahd gains a new goal, to kill Esmeralda Avnir. Knowing that his Vistani spies might be conflicted at the thought of slaying one of their own, Strahd relies on the druids and the werewolves of Salovich Woods, as well as human spies and vampire spawn hidden in Barovia's settlements, to help him find and kill Esmeralda. If Strahd learns that she and the characters are working together, he invites the characters to Ravenloft, expecting that Esmeralda will accompany them. The characters receive their invitation in the form of a letter delivered by one of Strahd's spies. If the characters open and read the letter, show the players Strahd's invitation. If the characters head towards the castle, they have no threatening random encounters on the way. Chapter 12 the Wizard of Wines. Wine is the lifeblood of Barovian people. 
it is one of the only indulgences left to them. Without it, many Barovians would lose their last shred of hope and succumb to utter despair. Although the Vistani often bring wine from distant lands, they share it infrequently. Thus, most of Barovia's wine comes from one source, the Wizards of Wine Winery and Vineyard. The Wizard of Wines was founded by a mage whose name is buried in the annals of history. The wizard fashioned three magic gems, each one as big as a pine cone, and planted them in the rich valley soil. These seeds gave rise to healthy grapevines, which produced sweet and plump grapes. Even after Strahd's curse settled over Barovia, the gems kept the vines and their grapes from succumbing to the darkness. Strahd bequeathed the winery and the vineyard to the noble Kreskov family as a reward for the family's loyalty. Later, an arranged marriage between the Kresovs and the Martikov family led to the land being taken over by a Martikov descendant. The winery and vineyard have been tended by the Martikovs ever since. At some point, the Martikov family became infected with widespread lycanthropy. The current patriarch, Davin Martikov, is a were-raven, as are his children and grandchildren. The were-ravens provide the wine to Barovian taverns for free, knowing the good it brings to the Barovian people. The winery is known for its three wines, the unremarkable Purple Grape Hush No. 3, the slightly more tantalizing Red Dragon Crush, and the rich Champagne did a stomp. Ten years ago, one of the vineyard's magic gems was dug up and stolen. As a result, the winery stopped producing its best vintage, the Champagne. No one knows what happened to the gem. Davian Martikov blames his middle son, Erwin, as described in Chapter 5 in Area N2, for the loss because Erwin was on watch the night the gem was taken. Davian is convinced that Erwin shirked his duty to spend time with his betrothed, and the two men have been at odds ever since. To this day, Erwin steadfastly denies his father's accusation. Adding to Davian's misery, the were-ravens have been fending off frequent attacks by Bavalasagya's scarecrow constructs. Three weeks ago, during one such attack, another gem was found, dug up, and taken. Davian believes it is in the possession of Bavalasaga, in Chapter 10 in Area U3. Davian's belief is correct. The gem was a lucky find for Bavalasaga, who had previously suspected that magic was the root of the vineyard's health, but knew nothing of its source. Even after this great discovery, Baba Lasaga continues to send her scarecrows against the winery, antagonizing the were-ravens like a bad neighbor. Five days ago, evil druids stole the third and final gem and bore it to Yester Hill as described in Chapter 14. The were-ravens launched a counterattack on Yester Hill, hoping to get it back, but to no avail. The druids and their blights proved more than a match for the lycanthropes. Two days ago, a druid returned with a horde of blights and drove the Davian's family from the winery. They have also poisoned the fermentation vats, leaving the winery with only a few bottles and barrels of drinkable wine. Even if the characters succeed in helping the Martikovs reclaim the winery, the wine production in the valley it will eventually stop as the vineyard dies off. Only by recovering the magic gems and replanting them in the soil can the characters ensure the Barovians aren't without wine to comfort them on dark, wretched nights? Approaching the vineyard, a branch of the old Sulevich Road leads to the vineyard. If the characters approach along this path, read, After a half mile, the road becomes a muddy trail that meanders through the woods, descending gradually until the trees part, revealing a mist-shrouded meadow. The trail splits. One branch heads west to the valley, and another leads south into the dark woods. A wooden signpost at the intersection points west and reads, Vineyard. If the characters head west on the trail towards the vineyard, read, A light drizzle begins to fall. Unpainted fences blindly follow the trail, which skirts north of a sprawling vineyard before bending south towards a stately building. The fog takes on ghostly forms as it swells between the neatly tended rows of grapevines. Here and there, you see rope-handed half-barrels used for hauling grapes. North of the trail is a large stand of trees. A man wearing a dark cloak and cowl stands at the edge of the trees, 
beckoning you. The beckoning figure is one of nine were-ravens, lawful good male and female humans, hiding in the grove to the north of the vineyard. If the characters ignore the cloaked figure and continue to the winery, the were-ravens keep their distance and wait to see what happens. The Martikov family. If the characters head towards the cloaked figure, the other were-ravens emerge from the stand of trees and greet them in human form. They wear dark leather rain cloaks and cowls. One of them is the current owner of the winery and vineyard, Davian Martikov, who is an old and suspicious man. Until he trusts the characters, he says nothing about stolen gems, but tells them that evil druids and blights have attacked the winery and forced his family to take refuge in the woods. If the characters rid the winery of its invaders, Davian is grateful. Only then does he tell them of the vineyard's three magic seeds that have been stolen. He describes them as gems the size and shape of pine cones, each one containing a glowing green light as bright as a torch. For all the good of Barovia, he urges the characters to travel to Berez in Area U and Yester Hill in Area Y to retrieve the two of them. He has no idea what happened to the third gem. Davian's group includes the following people. Davian, Adrian, his eldest son, Elvir, his youngest son, Stefana, his adult daughter, and Dag Tomescu, Stefana's husband. All five are members of the Keepers of the Feather, as described in Chapter 5 in Area N2. Also present are Stefana and Dag's four children, a teenage son named Claudiu, two young boys named Martin and Vigo, and a baby girl named Yolanda. The three youngest children are non-combatants, the boys are were-ravens with seven hit points each, and Yolanda is effectively a human with one hit point. She can't assume other forms yet. If the characters come to the vineyard looking to obtain wine, Adrian can confirm that there are three barrels in the loading dock in area W2, plus another three barrels and several wine bottles in the cellar in area W14. There is more wine still fermenting in area W9. Approaching the winery. If the characters continue towards the winery, read, Situated in the midst of the vineyard, the winery is an old two-story stone building with multiple entrances, thick ivory covering every wall, and iron fencing along its roofline. The trail ends at an open loading dock on the ground floor. A wooden stable of more recent construction is attached to the east side of the winery, Next to a loading dock, west of the winery is a crumbling well and a wooden outhouse. When the characters reach the winery, read, you hear the rustle of dead vines around you. Inhuman shapes emerge from the vineyard, their limbs cracking as they trudge forth through the mist and rain. Thirty needle blights, six in groups of five, emerge from the surrounding vineyard and make their way towards the characters and the winery. The blights are 120 feet away when they first become visible. They have a walking speed of 30 feet. Characters can either barricade themselves inside the winery, thus keeping the needle blights at bay, or stand and fight. If they stay outside and fight, druids and blights from inside the winery join the battle in the round shown below. On the third round, one druid and 24 twig blights from area W9 join. On the fourth round, one druid and five needle blights from area W14 join. On the fifth round, one druid and two vine blights from area W20 join. The druid lurking in area W16 carries a Gulthian staff. If the staff is destroyed, all blights within 300 feet of it instantly wither and die. The Gulthian staff, a rare item that requires attunement made from the branch of a Gulthius tree, as described in the Blight entry of the Monster Manual. A Gulthius staff is a spongy black length of wood. Its evil makes beasts visibly uncomfortable within 30 feet of it. The staff has 10 charges, which regain 1d6 plus 4 of its expended charges daily at dusk. If the staff is broken or burned to ashes, its wood releases a terrible inhuman scream that can be heard within the range of 300 feet. All blights that can hear the scream immediately wither and die. Vampiric Strike The staff can be wielded as a magic quarterstaff. On a hit, it deals damage as a normal quarterstaff. 
you can expend one charge to regain a number of hit points equal to the damage dealt by the weapon. Each time a charge is spent, red blood oozes from the staff's pores, and you must succeed on a DC-12 wisdom saving throw, or be afflicted with a short-term madness, as described in Chapter 8 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Blightbane When you are attuned to this staff, blights and other evil plant creatures don't regard you as hostile unless you harm them. The Areas of the Winery the following areas correspond to labels on the map of the winery on page 175. Area W1, the stables. The Martikovs keep two draft horses here and use them to pull their wine wagon. Area W2, the loading dock. Parked in the loading dock is a wagon with three barrels set in braces on the bed. A raised wooden walkway runs along the west, south and east walls. Through a hole in the ceiling you see a wooden arm of a loading crane with ropes and hooks dangling from it. The wine barrels in the cellar, area W14, are rolled up a ramp in area W12 to the crane on the upper floor in area W16. When lowered onto a wagon from above, empty barrels are rolled off the back of the wagon and stored in area W9. Three barrels on the wagon hold purple grape marsh number three. The south door has been forced open and hangs ajar. It can't be closed properly until repaired, though it can be barricaded. Area W3, the barrel maker's workshop. Strips of iron and wood lie in neat piles on the floor of this workshop, the walls of which are lined with tools. Two work tables stand against the east wall. Wine barrels are made here. The north door is barred from the inside. Area W4, the barrel storage. Rows of new barrels fill this room. A narrow staircase spirals upwards in the southwest corner. The room contains 13 empty barrels. Area W5, the veranda. Resting on a flagstone veranda are three five foot diameter wooden tubs. Their insides are stained with grape juice. Each tub has a short ladder bolted on the side and a catch basin tucked underneath. At the back of the veranda is a large set of sliding wooden doors, as well as a normal sized wooden door. Stone pillars and arches support the upper floor. This veranda is where grapes from the vineyard are crushed into juice. The sliding wooden doors are chained shut from the inside, and the smaller door is barred shut from the inside. Breaking through either requires a successful DC 20 strength check. Area W6, the well. A ring of tight-fitting, moss-covered stones encloses this 40-foot deep well. Area W7, the outhouse. Sweet-smelling herbs hang from the eaves of the ramshackle wooden outhouse, which has a small crescent moon carved into its door. The outhouse contains no surprises. Area W8, the storage. Bare hooks line the walls from this storage room, Shelves to the south hold several pairs of stained wooden sandals with oversized soles. Both doors to this room hang open. The one to the west is fitted with iron brackets and leads outside into the rain. Lying on the floor next to it is a five foot long wooden beam. Before fleeing the winery, the were ravens took the leather rain cloak stored here, but they left behind the wooden sandals that they wear when crushing grapes on the veranda in area W5. The wooden beam on the floor can be used to bar the outer door. Area W9, the fermentation vats. The rich smell of fermenting wine fills this large two-story chamber, which is dominated by four enormous wooden casks. Each one is eight feet wide and 12 feet tall. A wooden staircase in the center of the room climbs to a 10 foot high wooden balcony that clings to the south wall, which has four windows set into it at balcony level. Stacked against the wall underneath the balcony are old empty barrels with the Wizard of Wines burned into their sides. The balcony climbs another five feet as it continues along the west and east walls, ending up at a door leading to the winery's upper level. Underneath these side balconies are several doors, some of which hang open. Beneath the sloping roof stretches thick rafters, upon which scores of ravens have quietly gathered. 
they watch you with great interest. Four swarms of ravens perch on the rafters, but don't attack the characters under any circumstance. Unless they have been drawn outside, 24 twig blights and one druid, a neutral evil female human, are also present. If they are here, read, The balcony creaks, drawing your eye to a wild-looking figure hunched over the westernmost cask, pouring a flask of thick syrup into it. She wears a gown made of animal skins and a headdress of goat horns, and her hair is long and unkept. Suddenly, you see something skittering across the floor. It looks like a tiny creature made of twigs. It moves from its hiding place to under the stairs and disappears behind the easternmost cask. The four containers are fermentation vats, where grape juice is mixed with other ingredients and turned into wine. The easternmost cask has been split at the back, creating a six inch wide, six foot high opening through which twig blights can pass. All 24 twig blights are hidden in the cask, ready to emerge and attack when commanded to do so. While inside the cask, they have total cover against attacks that originate outside the cask. The druid is poisoning the fermentation vats. The three westernmost vats contain poisoned wine, enough to fill a total of 20 barrels. Drinking the poisoned wine has the same effect as drinking a potion of poison. Pouring antitoxin into the vats neutralize the poison, but also spoil the taste of the wine. Casting a purify food and drink spell on the vat neutralizes the poison without spoiling the wine. In addition to her animal skin gown and horn headdress, the druid wears a necklace of human teeth. If the characters attack the druid, she calls forth her twig bites. When that happens, the swarm of ravens descend from the rafters and begin attacking the blights. Each swarm tears apart one twig blight on each of its turns. The sliding wooden doors along the north wall, leading to area W5, are chained shut from the inside. The key to the padlock can be found in the office in area W20. The single door leading to area W5 is barred shut from the inside, as is the single door leading to area W2. Area W10, the glassblower's workshop. A dirty window in the south wall allows a dim light to enter the room. Wine bottles are manufactured here, as evidenced by the tools lying about. The wooden rack full of freshly blown glass bottles along the south wall, the hearth built into the southwest corner, and the barrel of sand standing next to it. A staircase descends underground, and between it and the rack of the bottles stands a barred door. The stairs lead down to area W13. The bottles stored in the racks don't have labels. The east door is barred from the inside. If one of the characters has the fortune of Ravenloft, the three of coins, the trader, they can find one of the treasures here. It's buried in the barrel of sand. Emptying the barrel or digging through the sand reveals the treasure without the need for a check. Area W11, the spiral staircase. This turret contains a stone spiral staircase. Windows on the outer wall allow light to enter. The stair connects all three levels of the winery. Area W12, the ramp. This turret has a sloping wooden floor that spirals from the cellar to the upper levels. Scratch marks suggest that the barrels are rolled up and down the ramp on a routine basis. The spiral ramp connects all three levels of the winery. The evil druids who have taken over the winery use this ramp to move between levels. Area W13, the back staircase. Thick moss covers the walls of this underground staircase. At the foot of the steps is a landing with an arched wooden door set into the north wall. This staircase connects areas W10 and W14. Area W14, the wine cellar. In the winery's heyday, the wine cellar was packed with barrels awaiting shipment, but those days are long gone. Wooden pillars and beams support the 10 foot high ceiling of this ice cold cellar which is split in two by a five-foot thick brick wall. A thin mist covers the floor. Each half of the cellar features an eight-foot tall wooden partition that doubles as a wine rack. The western rack stands empty, but the eastern one is half filled with wine bottles. Unless they have been drawn outside, 
five needle blights and one druid, a neutral evil male human, lurk in the eastern portion of this cellar. If they are here when the characters enter that part of the cellar, read, Something moves behind the eastern wine rack. Through holes you glimpse half a dozen humanoid figures, one with a full rack of antlers. You hear a gravelly voice mutter the words of a spell. On his first turn from behind the wine rack, the druid casts the Thunder Wave spell, which shatters 1d20 plus 10 of the wine bottles as it resounds throughout the cellar. The druid then orders the needle blights to attack. The cellar gets markedly colder the closer one gets to the north wall. Against that wall, in the eastern portion of the cellar, rests three frosty barrels containing purple grape marsh number three, a fact that is emblazoned on each barrel's side. A single bottle of purple grape marsh number three lies on the flagstone floor in the western half of the cellar. The wine rack in the eastern half of the cellar holds 40 bottles, the labels of which show that the wine is the winery's red dragon crush. A secret door between the two halves of the wine cellar can be pushed open to reveal a freezing cold passageway, which is Area W15. Area W15, the brown mold. If the characters open the secret door, read, it takes some effort to push open the secret door and you are greeted by a blast of cold air. A dark tunnel stretches for 15 feet, ending in an archway beyond which lies a shallow cave. Characters who have a source of light can see brown mold covering the walls, floors, and ceiling around the archway and the cave beyond. Rowing throughout the area, keeping the wine cellar cool, are ten patches of brown mold. These are described as dungeon hazards in Chapter 5 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. The brown mold is a hazard. Brown mold feeds on warmth, drawing heat from anything around it. A patch of brown mold typically covers a ten-foot square and the temperature within 30 feet is always frigid. When a creature moves within 5 feet of the mould for the first time on a turn, or starts its turn there, it must make a DC 12 constitution saving throw, taking 22 or 4d10 cold damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. Brown mould is immune to fire, and any source of fire brought within 5 feet of a patch causes it to instantly expand outward in the direction of the fire, covering a 10-foot square area, with the source of the fire at the centre of that area. A patch of brown mould that is exposed to an effect that deals cold damage is instantly destroyed. The characters that attempt to traverse this area are safe from the mould as long as they keep their distance. Area W16, The Loading Winch This room has a wooden floor with a 10-foot square hole cut into the middle of it, Looming over the hole is a wooden winch. Perched atop it is a man with wild hair, rotted teeth, and skin painted red with blood. He waves a gnarled staff made of a black branch and babbles at you. The man is a druid, a neutral evil male human, who fights only if cornered. Otherwise, he tries to flee by dropping onto the wagon in the loading dock below in Area W2. Then he looks for a place in the winery to hide. A character who understands Druidic can translate his words. Nature bows to my every whim, for I have the vampire stuff. A secret door in the north corner of the west wall can be pulled open to reveal a bedroom, area W17. The staff that the Druid wields is the Gulthus staff, as described previously. It can be used to destroy many of the blights within the winery. Area W17, the master bedroom. This bedroom normally belongs to Davin Martikov, but is currently being used by his daughter, Stefana, and his son-in-law, Dag, while they raise their baby daughter. This room contains a four-poster bed, its headboard carved the likeness of a giant raven. A soft black rug covers the floor between the bed and the door. In the corner of the south wall stands two slender wardrobes with a tapestry of a church hanging on the wall between them. Between the tapestry sits a handsomely carved rocking cradle. To the north, under a window, is a plain desk and chair. Other furnishings include a wooden chest and a freestanding mirror with a wooden frame. One of the wardrobes contains Stefiana's clothes, and the other contains Dag's. The desk holds manifests recording the wine shipments for the past century. 
A cursory examination of the recent records reveals that almost all the shipments were made to the following locations. BV, BW, K, Vistani, and S. These initials respectively refer to the Blood of the Vine Tavern in Barovia, the Blue Water Inn in the town of Valakai, the town of Krezek, the Vistani encampment, and S stands for Strad. Strad shipments are the oldest listed. The wooden chest is locked, and the key is hidden in a compartment of the bedpost. The character who searches the bed notices that a knob on one of the bedposts is loose and can be removed, revealing the compartment inside. Inside the chest are 50 gold pieces, as well as 270 electrum pieces. Each electrum piece has the profiled visage of Strad von Zarevich, as well as 350 silver pieces. A secret compartment within the lid can be found with a successful DC-15 wisdom perception check. It holds a gold locket worth 25 gold pieces, and it contains the painted portrait of a beautiful woman, which is Davian's deceased wife, Angelica, as well as a pouch containing five 50 gold piece gemstones. In this room there is a secret door in the north corner of the east wall that can be pushed open to gain access to the loading winch in Area W16. Area W18, the kitchen and dining room. This room contains a rectangular table surrounded by eight chairs, an L-shaped cupboard, and a floor-to-ceiling closet pantry. Next to the pantry is a small iron stove. The cupboards hold dishware and eating utensils, and the pantry holds cooking ingredients and the winery stores. Area W19, the sleeping quarters. Two pairs of bunk beds occupy this room. Against the west wall rests four identical footlockers. Davian, Andrian, and Elva sleep in the westernmost room. Claudiu and his two younger brothers sleep in the easternmost room, where a few toys are scattered about. One of the toys seems to resemble a child's wooden rocking horse, except the horse is black with wild eyes and has painted orange flames where its mane, tail, and hooves should be. Carved into the wooden nightmare is the name Bucephalus, and in small lettering, the slogan, is no fun, is no blinksky. The footlocker contains clothing and personal belongings, but nothing of value. Area W20, the printing press. The door to this room hangs open. In this chamber are a desk, a chair, a tall wooden cabinet, and a strange contraption that takes up most of the northern end of the room. Two vine blights and one druid, a neutral evil female human, are in the room, unless they have been drawn elsewhere. If they are here, read. Three creatures are here. One appears human, but it is caked with dirt and mud, so it's hard to know for sure. Her hair is full of twigs, and her face is hidden behind a veil of moss. She is rooting through the contents of the cabinet, haphazardly tossing them onto the floor. Behind her stand two creatures made entirely of dead vines. The druid and the vine blights fight to the death. Inside the cabinet is a key hanging on a loop of twine. The key unlocks the padlock to the sliding doors between the veranda, area W5, and the fermentation vats in area W9. The contraption standing near the north wall is a printing press, which Davian Martikov used to make the wine bottle labels. The ink is made from wine and stored in bottles in the cabinet, along with pieces of parchment and jars of glue. The following are special events that you can have occur after the characters have rid the winery of its current menace. The wine delivery. After restoring the Martikovs to their rightful positions, the characters might ask them to deliver wine to the Blue Water Inn, as described in Chapter 5, Area N2. The Vistani in the camp outside Valakai in Chapter 5, Area N9, or the Burgomaster of Krezek in Chapter 8, Area S2. A grateful Davin sets his son to the task immediately. Andrian and Martikov brings the three remaining wine barrels up from the cellar and sets them on the wagon while Eleva Martikov secures the horses. Adrian and Eleva make the delivery themselves, but they welcome the party's escort. If the characters don't volunteer for guard duty, Davy and Martikov suggest they go with the wine wagon to ensure their safety. If the characters escort the wagon, check for random encounters for each mile travelled. The wagon is also watched over by two swarms of ravens that swoop down and attack anything that threatens the wagon or the characters. 
The characters can trade the six barrels of wine for much needed treasure in the possession of the Keepers of the Feather, or the Vistani, as described in Chapter 5 in Area N2Q and Area N9I, or they can use it to buy their way into the walled visage of Kresik, as described in Chapter 8. The Winter Splinter Attacks If the characters leave the winery and return at a later time before dealing with the Winter Splinter, as described in the Druid's Ritual in Chapter 14, the enormous tree blight is sent from Yester Hill to ravage the vineyard and destroy the winery. The characters arrive to find the grapevines trampled and the winery in ruins. Winter Splinter's tracks are clearly visible through the trails to the south. Characters who follow the tracks can catch up with Winter Splinter as the blight slowly makes its way back towards Yester Hill. The Mardikovs narrowly escape the carnage and flee to the Blue Water Inn in Balakai in Chapter 5 in Area N2. Davian Mardikov is crushed by the loss of the winery, and the morale in Valakai sinks to an all-time low as word of the winery's destruction spreads through the town. Three days after Winter Splinter's attack, Baba Lasaga, as described in Chapter 10 in Area U3, dispatches seven scarecrows from Berez and order them to take up positions in the vineyard. To discourage the were-ravens from returning, these scarecrows attack anyone who crosses the vineyard or approaches the ruined winery.